so excited that you're here. We are going to be going through an hour of code with Turtle Graphics with Tracy the Turtle. And we have um, a guest speaker here who's going to give us some awesome insights into um, their experiences with code. Um, we are going to get started in just a minute or two. If you um, can find the chat, you are able to send a chat to me and my team here. And we would love to see where you're joining us from and what your grade level is, if you have any experience with code. So if you could find the chat, that will be helpful. We're going to be putting some links in the chat as we go through our session today. So that will be a nice thing to have up for you. And we will have a Q&A um, in a bit as well. So that's a great um, spot to have open so that you can communicate with us. And we're gonna get started in just about a minute. So if you would like to introduce yourself to us in the chat, that's a great start. We are so excited. We've been doing lots of um, school visits for the last two weeks for Hour of Code. Um, awesome. Thank you for joining us from Robinson High School, a web design class. This is great. So we're going to be um, doing a little switching gears, doing some Python today, and we're going to um, be working with uh, a turtle named Tracy to make some graphics. So we're going to get started. Thank you for introducing yourself. And um, my name is Julia Trigo, and I am a curriculum developer here at CodeHS. I have um, quite a few members of our team here um, to help us behind the scenes, answer some questions. And we have a special guest with us, which we're going to hear from in just a minute. So let's get started. We um, did some quick introductions. We're going to look really quickly at what code is used for. And then we're going to hear from our guest speaker on um, her experience in computer science. Then we're going to hop right into our activity um, with turtle graphics in Python. And then we're going to wrap up. We're going to show you how to share um, your awesome designs that you've created and then um, have some time for questions and, and some next steps. So let's get started. So what is code used for? Code is used all over the place, right? Um, we have computers everywhere. So we want to make sure that we have more people who understand the way that these computers um, work and are programmed so that we can make sure they work for everyone that is using them. So we have computers from our, you know, the first things we think of our computer, our phone, um, but we have even computers in our cars or sometimes even our refrigerators now, right? A refrigerator used to just be a cold box to hold our milk, but now we can have recipes on our computer and on our computer, on our refrigerator. Um, we can have um, different grocery lists on there so we can interact um, to make our lives a little bit easier. We see a bunch of different spots where code can be used. So if you are thinking, you know, well, I want to, I know what industry I want to be in. I want to be an animator or I want to work in healthcare. Um, code is still going to be used in your job. So even if you are not being a software engineer, software developer, or a web designer, um, you still may and probably will at this point use some sort of code in your, your job. So we see lots of different industries, lots of different ways that we use code um, every day um, in our lives. And the people that are making um, th that code, those programs work, um, are working behind the scenes. But none of this is working um, the way that you, know, you use it. You go on Roblox or you go on your Xbox and you play a game. That didn't just exist. Someone had to write that code. Um, and those job opportunities are immense because now we have so many um, different industries that are using computer science and computers. Um, these jobs are just so large. We have so many of them and we need people to fill these, these careers. So it's awesome that you guys are getting this chance to um, do some code in your schools. And then now with our hour of code, try out some Python today. 
So before we hop into our activity, we are going to hear from our guest speaker. We are here with Shreyoshi, and she is an um, engineer who works at Amazon. So we're going to hear a little bit about her um, experiences with code. You're going to have some opportunities to ask her some questions. So you may want to start thinking about those things um, in the back of your minds right now. And we'll have um, an opportunity for you to ask those into the Q&A so that we can bring them up and um, see what Sreyoshi's um, experiences are. So I'm going to turn it over to Sreyoshi and we're going to um, hear about all of the awesome uh, things that she's been doing. Thank you, Julia. So good to be here um, and speaking at this R of Code. Um, I'm excited that uh, many of you are going to be trying out Python. Um, I use a lot of Python at work. So um, let me back up a little and tell me tell you more about uh, my story. So um, I was trained as a mechanical engineer, actually. Um, and I was really interested in transportation. And uh, specifically, I worked in the railroads. Um, so my first brush with coding really happened when I was analyzing data from um, rail tracks. So, you know, how railway tracks uh, may have breakages over time. We were looking at, you know, trying to predict if we could uh, kind of say when those tracks may have breakages. And so that was my first kind of brush with coding, where um, I used a machine learning approach to classify data from uh, railway tracks to understand whether or not a track was broken or, or was fine. And so I, even though I don't have a background in computer science, I was able to really teach myself and use a lot of off the shelf um, kind of code that's out there. The great thing about a lot of these coding languages is that um, you, know, you have repositories of code. So you don't have to always start from scratch. You have an idea, you, you know about a context or a problem that you're trying to solve, and you can basically break it down into um, little tiny problems that you can then use to solve a bigger problem. Um, and for all of these tiny parts of the puzzle, you can use code that already exists. So you don't have to write from scratch every algorithm or every logic that you need for your entire program. Um, but basically, that's how I got interested in machine learning. Um, but I've always been someone who enjoys words and qualitative data. And I was um, studying engineers in the classroom. So part of my doctorate was basically understanding um, who makes it as an engineer, what is an engineer, um, who thrives in engineering, who belongs or persists in engineering. And as part of this research, we collected a lot of qualitative data. So qualitative data is basically text data that you collect through um, surveys. So for example, you know, the surveys that you fill out, you usually have a text box where you type in some thoughts. That is an example of qualitative data. You also have qualitative data coming in from interviews, from focus groups. So basically my research collected all of those qualitative um, data sets. And then we realized that we were dealing with classrooms in engineering, which had like 150 students. And so looking at qualitative data from 150 students manually takes a lot of time. So that's where we kind of looked into natural language processing and seeing if you know we could use some way to code or automate some initial or exploratory results from that qualitative data. So, um, so I started looking into sentiment analysis, um, looking into just, just basic information that we can get from text-based data. Um, that's basically what I did for my doctorate was to explore really how natural language processing can be used in education research. Um, and that kind of led me to industry where um, right after my PhD, I, um, I led global people research at McGraw-Hill. 
Some of you may have heard of McGraw-Hill. It's a learning sciences company. They do a lot of textbooks. And so as part of McGraw-Hill, I was leading their global people research and analytics uh, team, which is basically, um, you know, you have data from all of the employees at your organization, and you're trying to make meaning out of it. So a really great example is during the pandemic, right at the beginning of the pandemic, when it started, um, and, you know, everyone had to work from home. One of the first thoughts that leadership at companies we're thinking of are how can we best support our employees? What do they need? Um, you know, what are their thoughts on returning to the office? Um, what are the sentiments? Is productivity good? What is happening to innovation? How does collaboration work? So um, a people research scientist basically sends out surveys um, or interviews people, uh, conducts focus groups, and then collects all of those data and uses um, some kind of statistical technique or machine learning or AI-based uh, analysis to really make meaning of that large, large parts of data and then give it to senior leadership so that they can make some informed decisions about what the company is going to do and next steps. So for example, one of the things that we found was that employees were feeling really burnt out, especially women, because they were, you know, they, they were at home, they didn't have help, some were caregivers, uh, some were mothers, they had to tend to their family and work. And so they were feeling extremely burnt out. And that is one of the sentiments that we collected from our analysis. Um, and immediately we surfaced that insight to leadership and they realized that we have to do something about it. And so across the company, we made sure that uh, we kind of message employees that you know, flexibility is good, work at any time. This is, you know, we are going through a pandemic, your, your family, your life, that comes first. And so we tried to put in, we worked very, very closely with the communication team, with HR folks to make sure that there was, uh, the research was leveraged into company-wide communication, which really, um, encouraged flexibility, especially amongst women, um, and encouraged managers to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with their employees saying, hey, how can we help you be better and be productive at work? Um, and, you know, what are some of the challenges that you're facing? What are some of the resources that we can provide to you, for example, with mental health um, awareness? Um, so that's kind of an example of what a people research scientist does. And um, currently I work at Amazon doing pretty much the same thing, except that the scale is much, much bigger. Um, so at McGraw-Hill, um, my entire company was around 4,000 employees across the globe, which is a lot, but it's still really, really small compared to Amazon where you know we have 100,000 um, corporate employees across the globe. It's a huge company. And so at Amazon, I'm able to focus more on engineers, uh, software developers, and really, you know, get insight from them, get data from them to make their journey, um, their career journeys at the company more meaningful and productive. Um, so that, that was kind of a gist of what I do and how I got to where I'm at. But happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Yeah, I love what you said about um, bringing people's um, thoughts and, and um, you know, melding that, melding the emotions of people with um, computer science, because I think that is something that we totally think are so separate um, and finding a way to leverage that when you have such a large company and so many people that you have to be listening to. That's awesome. I also loved. <clears throat> the part that you said about um, not having to start from scratch, because we usually think, you know, um, coding or programming is such an individual experience. You're just doing it by yourself. You're sitting at a computer, you're writing a code. 
Um, but learning to use your resources is so smart, right? Understanding those concepts and then being able to apply those concepts when you see an example and then knowing how to use that to, to start from. Um, so that's awesome. Um, one question that I have, and at, if anyone um, on our call has any questions, again, you can throw them right in the Q&A and we will make sure those get answered. Um, but one thing I have um, a question about is, what is the best thing that you can do to become a better programmer? Because it sounds like um, your journey didn't start with, you know, going to college for programming. So how do you, um, you know, increase your knowledge? What are the things that you do to make sure that you are um, improving? That, that's a great question. I think all of us, uh, when we're starting out with code, or even if, you know, we're seasoned programmers, um, we are work in progress. Um, because code itself and the technologies around us are changing so rapidly. Um, so the toolboxes or the toolkits that you may have used in the past and toolkits are basically, you know, little resource packages that you can call upon to help with some of your work. So for example, if you're working on Python, there may be a package for statistics, which kind of helps you run uh, different analysis. So for example, if you want to run a regression analysis, you don't have to actually write down the equation. You can just call out a function from a package and it will run it for you. Um, so, you know, the packages that I used back in grad school when I was learning are so different from the ones that we are using right now. Um, the, you know, natural language processing itself is also evolving so much. Uh, we have so much more data, so much more uh, capabilities right now with training large language models. Um, I think what is really helpful is to not get intimidated by all of it. I think sometimes we um, we tend to just stick with what is comfortable for us and what we already know and have used and not explore because we're kind of scared and it happens to me as well, but we're kind of scared as to, you know, why break something that's working? Um, but I think it's really helpful to go out of that comfort zone every once in a while and to keep experimenting uh, because at the end of the day you need to be very confident that you're trying to solve a problem and all the things that you're using in code are just tools so think of them as a calculator for example don't don't think of them as you know really fancy languages or um, really tough to grasp mathematical models. They are, there are a lot of science and insights behind modeling, but when you're approaching it, don't get intimidated by the world of AI and code. Um, start small and take it little bite uh, size bits at a time. I think that that is really helpful for me. Um, and, and I think um, it's it's also helpful to, to kind of keep looking at external repositories and, and looking at what are some of the problems that people have solved, um, how have they optimized certain solutions, what are the approaches that they're using, and, you know, going to meetups or being part of, you know, R of Code, these kind of um, webinars or um, training sessions, or even, you know, going online on YouTube. YouTube has great resources. Um, just finding these resources and just listening or seeing or reading what others have done, I think is really helpful. Because once you're working on a context or a problem, you may feel that it's very unique, but more often than not, um, the problem may be unique, but the approach to it and the solutions may be uh, similar across different contexts. So um, I think a good programmer is someone who really goes out there and looks for, is adventurous basically, looks for what others have done and sees if they can use it in their context, in their use case. That's great. I love, I love that. I think we should make that a slogan. 
coders are adventurous. <laughs> the best programmer is adventurous. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And I think that so many times we think there's, you know, one way to do this, to solve this problem, and there's not. And there, you know, there may be, you may have already found the answer, but you can find it, there might be a better, a better answer to solve the, the same problem. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Rayoshi. Um, I think we are ready to move on to our um, activity, learning some Python, diving right in, becoming adventurous. <laughs> Um, so thank awesome. you so much, um, and uh, we will hear from you. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll speak again later. Yes. Good luck. Have a good one. All right. So we are going to start learning some Python. Here we go. So our activity for today, we are going to be drawing a letter of our name, and you can choose the first letter, um, but if you have a letter like K or R, it may be a little bit more difficult. So you can choose um, choose your letter, but maybe you wanna choose the first letter of your first name or your last name, or maybe your middle initial. Um, and we are gonna program this turtle to create that visualization of that letter for us. So let's dive in <clears throat> and see how we can do that. So in order to program or code, we need to give commands to a computer, right? That computer is only doing what we're telling it to do. So if we just um, if we just start the program, nothing's going to happen, right? We need to give those commands. So Tracy is going to be this turtle who's going to listen to those commands that we give her, and she is going to um, act accordingly. Tracy only speaks Python. So if we want Tracy to draw a letter T, we can't just say, hey, Tracy, draw a letter T, the way that maybe you could tell your friend and they would understand what you're saying, right? But Tracy doesn't understand that language. She only understands Python. And a really awesome thing is that Python is used, you heard Sreo, she, she said she uses Python in her career now. Um, our website uses Python, Instagram, YouTube, Google, all of these um, sites, these organizations are using this language that we're gonna start learning today. So Tracy is going to start in the center of her world. And her world is a coordinate system. So she lives at the center of the coordinate system at the point zero, zero. And when she starts, she is going to be facing right at that center position. We need to know a little bit about how large her world is to know if um, our um, drawing is going to be on that canvas that she lives in, that box. So we can see that Tracy can move forward 200 pixels, and pixels is the unit of measurement we use when we're talking about images on, on our computer. So she can move forward 200 pixels, and then she'll be reaching that, that front end of the screen. So our world, if we move her forward 300 pixels, we're not going to see her anymore. She's going to be off the screen. Similarly, we can move her backwards 200 pixels as well, and that would be a negative value. And you may... Um, See, these are our coordinates like X and Y. So our 200 or negative 200 is going to be our X. And at this point, she hasn't moved up or down at all. So that Y coordinate is still zero. We can move her up or down, and that will be uh, the same amount. So our um, world that she lives in is a square. She can move forward 200, up 200, back, or down 200, which would mean that all of the corners of her world are going to use those coordinates. Um, and we know that she needs to stay within these coordinates in order to um, have our image be shown on our screen. What this means, if she can move forward 200 pixels and backwards 200 pixels, it means that the entire world she lives in is 400 pixels wide. And similarly, the world is 400 pixels tall. So this is the, the information about her world. This is what we need to know to get started. But now we need to know some commands. How can we actually give her information in Python um, so that she will understand what we're saying? So first, the first command we're gonna learn, the one that you're gonna use all the time is our forward command. And our forward command is written with the word forward with parentheses, and then we put a distance value, a number inside the parentheses. That's how far in pixels we want her to move. And it's really important when we're using any programming language um, to make sure that we are focusing on spelling, capitalization, and punctuation. So if we write forward and we forget the R, 
which uh, happens a lot, she's not going to know what that means. She needs, we need to make sure we spell forward correctly. We need to make sure that it is written in all lowercase letters. And we need to make sure we have those um, parentheses with a number inside. So in this case, we see we have Tracy on the left. Then we give her that command forward 100. And then we see she moves forward 100 pixels and we see that line behind her. That's the trail that she is drawing. We have also some commands to turn her because if we only have forward, we could never be able to go up or down. In order to move her up or down, we first have to turn her. So we can use left or right. If we use left with a 90 in the parentheses, she will turn. So if she's initially facing right and we give her left 90, she will end facing up. And if we use right 90, she will end facing down. So we can use any of these. Um, and a, a little tip is that that 90 is the amount of degrees. So if Tracy's here and she moves to face up, we can turn her to go in the middle. So if you have like a letter K or N and you need that line that is at an angle, that would be our 45 degree angle. So we can use other numbers inside. If you want Tracy to move all, turn all the way around, she's facing up, you want her to face down, you can either use left 180 or right 180 and she'll just turn completely around from where she's facing. The last two commands that we're gonna um, need to learn to before we hop right in is pen up and pen down. And a lot of times, these can get confusing because they say up and down in them. It doesn't mean that Tracy's going to move up or down. All this means is that she has, Tracy is like a pencil, right? When she moves, she draws a line. But if we wanted to draw a letter, a lowercase letter I, we would need to draw the dot on the top, then pick our pencil up and then move below it to then draw the bottom line. If we couldn't pick our pencil off the paper, we could never correctly draw a letter I. So we use pen up and pen down to be able to move Tracy to a different location without leaving that trail. So if we write pen up and then move her forwards, she's gonna pick her pen off the paper, then move so she's not leaving a trail. If we then want her to start leaving a trail, we have to write pen down and then move her and that then we'll see her, um, her trail behind her. So you're going to practice around with these commands. Um, but one note is that the pen up and pen down commands don't include any numbers inside of them. Remember, pen down doesn't mean she's moving down. So we don't put any um, information inside those parentheses. They're just blank. Oh, and a last note is that Tracy always defaults to starting with her pen down. So if you um, right off the bat, right forward 100, she's going to move and there's going to be a line behind her. So if you're trying to draw maybe a letter A and you want to move her to a different spot before you start your letter, you have to write pen up at the beginning. So let's, we're going to take a look at Tracy's first letter. She's drawing a letter T. And you saw at the beginning that our letter was kind of like a bubble letter with um, color filled in. But we're just to get started, we're just going to draw it like we would with a normal pencil. So you see her T here is just drawn with those two lines. So we're going to hop over and I'm going to give you this, um, this link in just a second. Um, but when you go to our link, you're going to initially get to a, a screen with a video. The video is just going to show you the information that we just went over together. So you can skip the video if you would like. If you want to refresh or you want to hear it again, um, you can definitely click on this video. But if not, we're going to skip to this first um, paper symbol, which is our example, Tracy's first letter. So if we um, head to this um, program, we're going to see there's already some commands written in here. And it tells us what she's drawing at each portion of our program. So whenever we want to run our program, we can hop right over here and click the run button. And we see Tracy moves, she draws her line, she goes backwards. And you can see we're using pen up and pen down for her to move drawing a line at some points, right? She moves down, she doesn't draw a line, then she's drawing a line. She stops drawing it, then she drops it. So we can um, use a combination of all of these commands to create our letter. When you're done looking at this example, you can click next or you can click 
down to the pencil, which is our exercise that is where you're going to start writing your, um, your program. So we're going to see the commands that we learned. We're going to see some options here. So I said, if you wanted to draw an A, um, you might have to use that 45 degree angle, but you could choose to just draw it boxy like this. And that is totally fine. So lots of different options for you. Um, if you want to give it a try, test something. A lot of programming is just writing something, testing it, seeing if it works, and then learning from that. So once we get started, you're going to have a blank, um, a blank space to write your code. If I start with my forward command, I see that she draws her line. Again, if I don't want her to draw her line, I can use pen up before I use forward. And now she doesn't draw her line. So you're going to start on this third um, activity, this um, exercise, draw your first letter. And this is where you're going to draw your letter. Um, once you're done, you can move on. You can click submit and continue or click on the bottom here, Tracy's bubble letter, and you will see her draw her bubble T. And then on this next pencil, that's where you are going to draw your bubble letter. So you're going to be able to continue moving on um, as you work through the activity. So um, there's two options here. If you have a CodeHS account, what I highly suggest is first log into your CodeHS account. If you, um, once you're logged in, then you can just type this into the search bar, into, into the URL, and it will keep you logged in. So if you have an account, you want to make sure that your name shows up up here when you're on the Tracy activity, that means it will save it. The reason that's important is because if you draw your letter and then you move on to the next activity and then you go back, it won't save it if you're not logged in. So you can um, log in first and then go to this link, which we dropped into the chat. And you can start on that first pencil to draw your letter. If you don't have an account, that is totally fine. You can go right to this activity and draw your letter. But just make sure if you if you wrote some code and you want to use it again, make sure you copy and paste it before you move on, because once you go back, it won't save. So that's an important note. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, I'm going to put this link back up in, in one sec, um, but you have some options for how you can ask questions. So you can um, go right to the Q&A as you're working and say, you know, I'm trying to do this and that's not working. Can you help? Um, and we will be there to help you out or you can ask your teacher um, and your teacher might have some options for you. Um, and I'm gonna leave this screen up. So this, um, hopefully you'll be able to see your different commands that we have learned, some tips, it might help to draw it out before you try to code it and a reminder about that canvas size. So again, we're gonna start here on that first pencil, which is where you're going to um, be writing your letter. Then you can click submit and continue and move on. Um, on this last video is where you're going to learn to add color. And just for our last five minutes, we're going to share out some um, of your creations. So I will show you how to share a little bit later. I want to give you a good about 20 minutes to work on this activity, and then we'll come back together. So I'm going to, um, we put this link right into the chat. So hopefully you have that there. I'm gonna leave this screen on and I'm gonna be quiet so I will let you work and make your creations.
Hope everyone is having a great time building their, writing their programs. We're gonna start sharing in about 10 minutes. So keep, keep working.
All right. So as you guys are still working, um, we have a, another five minutes to keep keep going. But I want to just put up this slide so you'll know how you can share because we would love to see some of your designs. So we're going to drop this link in the chat as well. But if you do have um, something that you created that is awesome that you want to show us, you can click more on the top of your um, screen and then choose share and you'll get a link and you can paste that link into this um, Google form and we will be able to see that and be able to share it um, with everyone here. So keep working. We're going to um, hopefully start getting some of these um, programs and then we can share in a few minutes.
All right, we're gonna come back together and finish up. Um, I don't see any links shared um, for your designs, but that's okay. You might still be working. I know that um, some of these take a little while and you might um, just need a little bit more time to make them perfect. So um, I wanted to show you where you can, um, how you can continue working through our, our code. So um, at the bottom, you'll learn how to add color at this video and you'll get your badge um, at this um, stage. You'll get a certificate for um, completing your hour of code. If you see, there are still some more activities after here. So there's some really cool things that you can do with our turtle to make even um, more intense um, programs. So you can see this one, Tracy is drawing her letter T, but she's using lots of designs and circles. Um, and she's using some other programming concepts like functions and loops and variables um, to design her letter. Um, you can see here, there's also a, a fancy letter A, and this is just using the commands that we learned. So nothing, um, nothing else other than the ones that we learned today. So um, you can do lots of really cool designs if you wanna keep working with your, um, your program. Um, so um, this link, if you logged in, you can always come back and you'll be able to start from where you, where you left off. If you didn't log in, that's okay. You'll just have to be um, starting your exercise um, from scratch because again, it won't save your work if you leave the, um, the exercise and come back to it if you don't have a login um, linked. But this is definitely something that you can um, keep working through. We have lots of hour of codes on our site. Um, so you can uh, ask your teacher if there's some more time maybe uh, later in the year for you to keep working through um, different hour of code activities that we have. And that's, those are all found at codehs.com slash HOC. And you'll see the whole library of all of the different options that we have for you to work on. Um, if you got that Tracy badge, you worked through your, um, your ac activities today, you can print that, you can share that. We would love to see that you are um, completing your hour of code and we are really proud of you for um, working on your project and learning some Python today. So thank you so much. We um, had a lot of fun hearing from Sreyoshi earlier. Um, this recording will get sent out. So if you, um, were, you missed any part of it or you wanna use it again with some more classes, um, that is gonna be available for you. And we have a survey here um, who, um, where you can just leave us some feedback. Um, that QR code is right there. So thank you so much. Um, we'll leave this up for just a, a few minutes, but thank you and have a great day. Have a great rest of your computer science education week. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day.